when we as individuals are looking for a mate to share our lives with and experience life with and grow old with, quite often the initial attraction between two people is nothing more than physical. We see someone, we like how they look, and we pursue that person based upon how they look. And unfortunately then, as is often the case, when time progresses, we realize that the person that we were attracted to because they looked just right to us doesn't always possess those characteristics that we want in life. And we find ourselves very disappointed. We're very fortunate if we happen to be attracted to someone who turns out they're really nice, they're really kind, they're very loving, they're very supportive, and, and you just, you know, you get along so well. That's, that's a real blessing. But I think one of the reasons why we have so many people whose lives and marriages end up falling apart is because we get so wound up in how each other, you know, how we look. And that's, that physical thing, that little physical attraction is what we base our relationship on and tell me, doesn't it fade away? Amen. It definitely does. It fades away with time, you know? <laughs> and so, what does that have to do with the message today? I, I think that you'll get it. As we pursue a study in what would be called church doctrine, what are those things that you believe and why do you believe them? Now I mentioned physical attraction just a minute ago and when you think about how all creatures here in the world exist and the level upon which all creatures interact, we do start out with the physical level. Every creature on earth has physical needs, physical desires. They exist to eat and drink and reproduce and gain and grow. Whether or not we're talking about the squirrel out in the tree or the creatures, the ants and things that are underground or people. There's that base level of existence. Then we as human beings, we talk about how there's something that separates us from the rest of the creatures in the world. We call it our ability to have social development. And so we have societies that we form. And we interact with each other. We have government that we form and we function within our society under rules that we develop that help us to interact. But then again you find that there's an, another level beyond that. People talk about intellect and culture and of course it's all a matter of interpretation because you could have someone move from like New York City or even Chicago or LA and come here to rural Indiana and they would say you people have no culture here <laughs> you know you got no intellectual opportunities here but it's all a matter of perspective yet that appears to be a, a level above just social interaction in society in the form of culture in intellect. But is there something else? Is there a different dynamic, a different dimension that cannot be expressed in just physical existence, society, 
intellect and culture? Is there a spiritual dimension, an unseen world, an unseen existence that goes beyond and transcends the things that we see here in the world? And as the chief component of that spiritual existence, people have to come to a determination as to whether or not they believe God exists. Does God exist? In Psalm 14, it says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But is that actually a foolish assumption? Scientists, psychologists, people who have spent many years studying come to the conclusion that there is no God. And yet, true mathematicians and people who are willing to ignore what society and intellect say and actually look at even the facts that are set before us arrive at a different kind of conclusion. Does not nature itself, don't the heavens themselves, doesn't the design of all that we have indicate to us the existence of something beyond ourselves? And of course, you being gathered together here on a Sunday morning have probably already come to that conclusion that God indeed does exist. But scientifically speaking, take the laws of thermodynamics that physicists try and promote. It says there that all things that are organized and constructed have a tendency to go into disorganization. You can make something out of iron and form it, but it will eventually go back into being something that is unformed. Things have a natural tendency not to be organized, but to be disorganized. And that in itself shows the likelihood of a creator to be extremely high. I don't want to talk about evolution at the moment, but I have to insert here, it makes me laugh to read some of the things that are spoken in science classes in dealing with evolution. Out of the primordial ooze came the first lizard, and it was blind, and the lizard bumped his head on a rock, and the sore that was there on his head turned into an eye, and he could see. It's a miracle of science and evolution. I mean, how much of a step of faith would you have to have in order to believe that the bump of a head against a rock would produce an eye? And yet, people are taught that because they don't want to believe that there is a spiritual level beyond that which can be seen, beyond that which can be touched. So, I personally believe that design theory itself, the fact that all that we have shows such great intricacy of a creator, all that we know supports the idea that something greater than us has created us. 
design theory, a very good support for the existence of God. The mathematics of it all, as far as chance goes, it's been said that the likelihood of even the development of a single creature, like a bacteria, with as little as, say, 5,000 genes in it, as opposed to something like ourselves, that likelihood is similar to a tornado going through the junkyard, mixing up the parts found in the junkyard and moving on, and there sets a jet plane that has randomly been assembled by the tornado. Or the winds blowing through the sand out in the desert, randomly producing a watch that is set to the correct time and date, made by the wind and the sand, just bringing it together. A true mathematician who's willing to honestly look understands that the odds of us being here without the existence of God are essentially zero. So, we have a God, but what is the nature of His existence? We, I personally, teach and we in this congregation believe that the nature of God's existence is in the form of a trinity. Now the word trinity does not anywhere appear in the Bible. And in fact you have people who are spiritual who believe that God exists. I mean, they're not just superstitious. I mean, even the Apostle Paul, if you remember, he, he went on Mars Hill and he stood and he looked out at the people according to Scripture and he said, you folks are so superstitious. I mean, you believe in all these different gods and you even, you even put up an altar to the unknown God in case you missed one. And, and I'm here to tell you about that unknown God and how he sent his son Jesus into the world and how he died on the cross and was resurrected from the dead. I'm here to declare that unknown God to you because everybody's superstitious. I mean, face it, we were talking about those scientists just a moment ago. They'll be superstitious scientists. They might believe in ghosts. They might believe in demons. They might believe in aliens. They might, I mean, they might believe in time travelers. They might believe there's a Loch Ness monster or an abominable snowman. But, but believing in God is a whole different thing. But what kind of God do we have? We talk about a trinity. And spiritual people, even spiritual people in the Christian churches, what we would call Christian dumb, do not believe that there is a trinity because it's not written in the Bible specifically. The Muslims and the Jews follow the Old Testament statement that the Lord God is one God, one Lord. It's written more than once. And yet, if you look in Genesis, in the creation story, in Genesis chapter 1, God says, let us make man in our image. I taught English, and us and our are plural. And so even though the Lord our God, the Creator, is one, He is a plurality. And for us as human beings, that seems hard for us to understand. I often, when I talk with children, use an egg. Because an egg has three parts. It's a shell, a white, and a yolk. You call the shell egg shell, you call the yolk egg yolk, you call the white egg white, and yet you call all three of them together an egg. When you are outside in the very early spring, where winter is turning into spring, and there's been ice, and the ice has begun to melt, and the sun is shining down, and you see the ice with the water on top of it and the steam rising up off of the water. That's all the water. It's the ice, the water, and the steam. 
It's the water existing in three different parts, three different forms. And so we have God existing in multiple forms. You see it specifically in Scripture in Luke chapter 3 when Jesus is baptized. Jesus himself is here. He steps into the water to be baptized and is baptized. And scriptures say that the Spirit falls upon him in the form of a dove and the voice speaks down from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so the idea of there being a triune God is clearly represented by the fact that God himself declares that he is more than one but one. And in Jesus' baptism, all three persons of God are mentioned. Now, I leave room... The book of the Revelation talks about the seven spirits of God before the throne. There might be seven different spirits. But I only see the Holy Spirit addressed specifically as the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, probably referring to that same essence of God in a spiritual form. And... That's why I stick to the concept of there actually being a trinity in itself. Now, amongst Christendom, there are well-respected denominational groups that say that in reality there is only Jesus. It's called the Jesus Only Movement, but you would have churches in this area that generally would believe that Jesus only only concept. But when you read in Scripture and you have Jesus Himself going out to pray and praying to His Heavenly Father and speaking and calling out to His Heavenly Father even to the point where He says not my will but thine be done. As Jesus is preparing to go to the cross and die for us there even in the knowledge that he is going to be resurrected from the dead, yet he cries out to his heavenly Father, not my will but thine. Pretty clear that there are at least in that statement two. Not my will but thine. Jesus goes out to pray. Who is he talking to? He says, Father, and he refers to his Father, and he refers to himself, even though when he is with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the other Jews, and he's teaching, he says, I and my Father are one. Meaning that they are of the same essence. They are God. I and my Father are one. Jesus himself saying, of that day and hour when heaven and earth will be destroyed. The angels don't know it. The Son doesn't know it. Only the Father knows it. Which would indicate that even though all of them are God, they exist also as separate parts of the same being. You have a head. You have a foot. You have a hand. Each of them have different jobs to do, and yet they're all still a part of you. And that is the concept of there being a trinity. But if the Spirit of God exists, and if God the Heavenly Father exists, and if Jesus exists, and if there is an us and an our in Scripture, is Jesus God? Or is Jesus, as the Muslims preach, just a good man? 
a great prophet? Or is he, as some Jewish people would teach, a deceiver and a liar? Is Jesus God? Did Jesus make any claims concerning himself? Does the Bible declare that Jesus is more than just a prophet? One of the things in Scripture that I think is very easy to follow regarding whether or not Jesus is God is from the book of John. And it's a fairly simple mathematical calculation. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, so if the one part of God that became flesh, and who is it that scriptures say became flesh and dwelt among us? Jesus, born of the virgin in Bethlehem. The angel of the Lord telling the Virgin Mary that she was going to give birth to the one who was going to be the Savior, that the Spirit of God was going to move upon her, and the one that she would conceive was going to be holy, set apart from his birth. The Word became flesh. That one who became flesh and dwelt among us, John says, was God. Originally, before he became flesh, known as the Word. So in reality, when we talk about before the birth of Christ, Jesus was actually known as the Word of God there in heaven. He was the Word, He was with God, was God, and He became flesh and He dwelt among us. So the Bible declares that He's God. What about Jesus Himself? When He was with the Pharisees and Sadducees, he said, you guys say that Abraham is your father. Is that a claim that the Jewish nation makes? And of course, yes it is. Father Abraham. They look back to this patriarch as being their spiritual father. And the father of the race of the Hebrews. You guys, Jesus says, look to Abraham as your father, but I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. That statement, I am, when Jesus used it about himself, caused them to want to stone him, to kill him on the spot. Because they recognized that the statement that I exist was Jesus himself declaring to be the one who told their patriarchal family members that he existed. Who am I supposed to say has sent me? You, God, you're sending me to talk to these people. I just don't think that I'm capable. Who am I supposed to tell them that sent me? And the answer was, I am that I am. Tell them that I am sent you. Why? Because who actually exists before a creation? God. He's the self-existent one. The only reason you exist is because God created your ancestors and gave them the ability to procreate leading to your existence. But when there was nothing, God still was. He doesn't have to have something else for Him to exist. He is the self-existent one, the I Am. Jesus made that claim about Himself. But not only that, experientially, how many people have you seen or heard say that they were God, declare that they would die, and in three days and three nights 
rise back from the dead and then have that take place and have thousands of people witness it and indeed have their closest associates for fear even of their own death be willing to themselves die rather than deny that it was true? And the answer is nobody. Jesus is it. The resurrection itself also shows experientially that Christ Jesus is who He said He is. He died on that cross for us, came back from the dead, received in His own body the punishment for our sins, and lives even now. God exists. He exists as more than one. And a part of that more than one is Jesus. But what about the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit God? When Jesus was preparing for His crucifixion, He said to His disciples, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you without a helper. I'm going to go, but I'm going to pray that God will send to you, and here's the term that Jesus used, another. Another comforter. If you have a piece of candy and somebody gives you another, what's the another that they give to you? It's another piece of candy. If you have God present with you, and God present with you says, I am going to send to you another, what would you expect Him to send? Another. Another one like Him. Even the Holy Spirit. Now, there was a reason for that, because Jesus, when He was resurrected from the dead, having bore our sins on the cross, existed in a bodily form. Years ago, when Beth Ann, my wife Beth Ann and I used to travel around and minister to people, I would often ask this question. I would say, how many of you think that Jesus Christ is right now in a body? And the hands would stay down. And I'd say, how many of you think that Jesus Christ right now is a spirit? And the hands would go up. It's just because they hadn't read Scripture. I mean, Jesus, when He appeared to His disciples after the crucifixion and in the resurrection, said to them, Handle me and see, for a spirit doth not have flesh and bone as you see me have. So Jesus, in the resurrection, having borne our sins and come back from the dead, He was in a body. He cannot dwell in you and help you. He said to his disciples, it's expedient for you. It's better for you if I go away. And they couldn't believe that. But right now, if Jesus was here, if he was over in Jerusalem, who'd be here? What part of God would be here and able to dwell in you? And the answer was nothing. So Jesus said, if I go, then the Holy Spirit can come. And that Holy Spirit, that other comforter, another one, will be able to dwell inside of you. And therefore, as 1 Corinthians declares, you become, you literally are, the temple of God. When? If the Spirit dwells inside of you. Who lives in God's temple? God lives in His temple. Who is God's temple? Where does God live? In you. And what part of God lives in you? The Spirit. And so, the Spirit is God. What is the nature of God? I said that his nature was triune, multiple. But still, even so, 
in thinking about that. What would some entity have to have? What characteristic would an entity have to have in order to be God? You ever thought about that? Does God God have to I mean does God have to be love in order to be God? Would God have to be everywhere in order to be God? No. Would God have to be more powerful than anyone else in order to be God? See, so, you now that's kind of, I think that's where the line's drawn. In order to be God, He would have to be all powerful. And what was the name that God first revealed Himself by to people? He said, They knew me by my name, God Almighty. Because He is the all-powerful One. In fact, in the beginning, God created. In the beginning, that God is the all-powerful ones. The let us create man in our image. The us there is Elohim, which in Hebrew is the all-powerful ones. God has to be all-powerful. And now I get back as we end this message to where I started. God is all-powerful. And you are so lucky. Amen. Because not only is He all-powerful, it just turns out that He is love. And He loves you. That He is kind. And He is generous. And He cares about you. And Jesus, being God made a promise that He's coming back like a bridegroom coming back to take His bride. And the bridegroom coming back to take His bride could be like the caveman going out to take His woman. He could, you know, according to like you see in the cartoons, you know, you grab her by the hair, whack her on the head, drag her into the cave. God wouldn't have to be anything more than just the all-powerful one who came back here to do whatever He wanted to with you. But you are so lucky, so blessed, that the one who created all things, who came here and died for you, loves you so much, wants to spend eternity with you, wants you to be a part of His spiritual being. Even to the point where when you have faith in Him, He sends His Spirit to live inside of you, looking upon you as being His holy temple, willing to dwell in you, loving you, preparing a place for you, that all those who believe on Him will be able to share His eternity. We are so blessed. Is there a God? Yes. We believe in God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. We believe He exists in three persons. And to read that little doctrinal statement, we believe in the existence of God Almighty manifested in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, each one being God, yet all three together being God, a trinity coexisting from eternity past to eternity future. That's why that's a part of our doctrinal statement. And aren't we blessed for Him? Amen. 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 If you've never prayed and let God know that you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and is risen from the dead, you can do that right where you sit. In fact, I'll lead you in a prayer. So right now, won't you just say these words right after me? Just say, Heavenly Father, repeat it right after me. Heavenly Father, Thank you for Jesus. I know He died on the cross for me. I believe He came back from the dead. I pray that You'd come into my life. Forgive my sins. I receive Jesus as my Savior. And I give my life to You. And thank You for saving me. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me and believed in your heart what you were saying with your mouth, then the Spirit of God comes to live inside of you, even right now. He's like a seed that gets planted inside of you that begins to grow. It's a seed that needs to be watered and it needs to be protected. And you can water it by reading God's Word and by praying and by associating with other Christians. And you can protect it and help it to grow by finding a good church to go to, a Bible-believing church, and, and having someone teach you more about God's Word so that that little seed that was planted today can take root in you and grow and help turn you into exactly what God wants you to be. It's been my privilege to be able to share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may God bless all of His children, all those who believe on His Son.